going on, everybody? Welcome back to another Bass Fishing Underground podcast. Today, we've got a special guest here. We've got Lawson Hibden, um, legendary fishing family, the Hibdens, and there's Bassmaster Classic titles, there's Major League Fishing titles, there's FLW titles, there's, I think if you if you can win it, they've probably won it <laughs> one way or another. I don't know, Fruit Jar Tournaments, the Lake of the Ozark, Night Fishing, the, yeah. the biggest in the world, you guys got them dialed in. So, welcome, thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so, Lawson, you had a great tournament, you know, just recently in the MLF event. Um, that's awesome to see. This is, is this your first year on tour? It is. It's give us, give, yeah, give, give us a background kind of who you are, what you are, what you've been doing and what the future holds. Well, I, we started off this year, you know, is pretty decent start to the year. Uh, started off down there at Okeechobee and had a decent tournament made it out of there with Jack, you know, that's always a good thing for the Hibdens because in Florida, you know, you never know what's going to happen with us. And we're not crazy about that type of fishing down there, but it was a good start to the year. Uh, had another decent tournament. Uh, I can't even remember where all we've been now, but <laughs> I've had only had one really bad tournament, and that was at Lake Murray this year. Which yeah. is odd to me because I really I, thought you would have smoked that one out. You know, it's kind of highlandy, isn't it? Yeah, and in practice, I thought I was going to. I mean, I was catching 16, 18 pounds a day, and that's not going <laughs> to win there, but, you know, I thought that I was going to catch them. You're going to make some money. And I caught like 10 pounds a day, and that sucked, yeah. you know. And, but – Made up for it a little bit. Went to Ufala, caught him down there. Uh, went to the Potomac at this last one and led it for three days and then kind of stumped my toe on the last day, and they were just leaving me every day, you know, <laughs> going out to that grass. And I was – there wasn't too many guys up fishing shallow, so that helped me out a lot. I could really move around the first three days. And if Lawson Hibben gets to go fishing, what do you do? What, I mean, what's what what rods are on your deck? What what are you doing? I I mean, I'm a power fisherman, but I I don't mind doing anything. You know, I like to finesse fish and all that stuff. But I'll do anything to catch a bass. You know, I I don't have a bait that you know just I like to throw a jig. You know, if I had one thing that I could throw, it'd be a jig. But I don't mind doing anything, and I've made myself learn everything you know i've tried to do this and that here everywhere we go just so i don't ever get in a pinch you know where uh, yeah you hear guys talking about well i don't know what i'm doing with that i'm not sure <laughs> that well i don't want to be that yeah. and you know like i say if i have a few rods on the deck at the potomac i had a couple of different jigs laid out i had a chatterbait laid out uh a weightless worm you know cinco type bait but for the most part, the first three days of the tournament, it was all on a little flipping jig that we make. That's just, I could catch my limit every day on chatterbait pretty quick. And they were weighing 10, 12, 13 pounds. And I went and made some good calls. If you would have told me to go to the Potomac River and catch 13 pounds a day, I think Drew Sanford as an angler would be like, I'm in, I'm done, yeah. I'm good. Well, before, <laughs> during practice, you know, I thought, 13 to 15, I said, yeah, if I can catch that every day, I'm going to be doing something. Well, during tournament, it was doing something. I just got some key bites that yeah. I wasn't really expecting. I knew that I was getting a few good bites, but I didn't really know how many I was going to get. And have you have you fished tidal water stuff? I mean, I know your family has fished so long, but this is your rookie season on the MLF yeah. Pro Circuit. I mean, I've been to some tidal stuff, you know, just fishing with dad and grandpa, but it was my first major tournament Here ever you go, fishing dump the your tide. boat in and go to it. Yeah. And well, I mean, what did you think when you did that? I mean, did, I know you probably don't get rattled. You've been around this your whole life. But it's one of those, like, what, what's your mindset going into some of these lakes that you've never been to? Like the Potomac, for instance. What did you well, think? I mean, the Potomac, that's that tide there is a little different than some tides because it only fluctuates about a foot and a half, you know, maybe a little more. Some on high tides and low tides, you know, really high and really low, it'll fluctuate a little more. But that's really not a big swing. But where I noticed it, I had one log that <laughs> I caught like 15 keepers off of. And that's no exaggeration. They caught most of them on camera. Wow. But I caught like 15 keepers off of one log that was out on this big, you know, as a grass flat, and it had channel running right through the middle of it. And, but the edges of that grass, you know, they were only like a foot and a half deep. So that log, when it was low tide, was out of the water. 
that's what puzzled me how much those fish actually move in and out with the tide because when that tide would get up they were all over that log and that kind of threw me off a little bit you know I couldn't just go and pinpoint them like a lot of guys talk about I did on low tide I just went to the deepest wood that I could find yeah you know and that was fairly easy to do I had one little creek that you know it's pretty simple you just go up through there and if you find a log that's got three or four foot of water on it that had a fish on it for the most part so Back in the day, I fished the bass opens on the James River, and it was a little bit tougher from a standpoint of we didn't have forward-facing sonar stuff right. like that. Were you seeing that on your graph, or were you just seeing it sticking out of the water? Did it, You know what I mean? Was it stuff that people couldn't see, or uh, was it visible? The main creek that I fished in the whole time uh, is Aquia. You know, it's not like a big secret. Everybody fishes in there, but there wasn't that many guys in there this time. Really? And I noticed in practice, you know, I fished in there the first morning practice, and there was only like two or three boats up in the creek. And it was me, Zell Rowland, uh, which also caught them the first three days. And You're in good company. Yeah, there was only like <laughs> one other boat back in there. And huh. that excited me a little bit. And I was like, well, you know, they'll figure it out through practice. Well, I came back in there the second day. At the end of the day, we only get two days practice. And I came back in there at the end of the day, and there was still nobody in there. And I was like, well this might be good, you know, and I, I had figured out some other creeks. Uh, I went way on down, you know, towards where the salt water really yeah. infuses. And I had one other one down there that it would have been kind of a gamble, but you know, that's where some of the tournaments get won at up there. And I just never felt like I needed it in the last day. I felt like I should have <laughs> went down there and I never did. And, oh, you know, that's yeah. going to haunt you, but yeah. you catch you know good stringers like i did and you, you just don't want to gamble on stuff like that but i guess you probably should to win but no nah, i mean it was definitely a different experience actually having to go there and figure them out and, you know i i didn't use my graphs a lot up there and it was mostly just you know nuts and bolts fishing i went That's and fun fish stuff that looked good to me uh you know, I looked for hard edges in the grass and any piece of wood that was a little deeper, any rock. I caught some off of a bridge. There was a lot of stuff that, you know, I, th I think people were avoiding it a little bit, thinking that those fish were post-spawn and moving out to that grass. And I really think that by the third and fourth day, that's what happened to me. I think that those big females moved out and went towards the grass and I just didn't follow along with them. Yeah. But, yeah. Pretty neat though. Top yeah. 10 yeah, first it was a year. Good tournament. Yep. Good absolutely. Tournament. Absolutely. Good points. Yep. Yep. How are you sitting in the points? Uh, I think around 30th now. Good. Uh, like I say, Lake Murray really gotcha. fumbled pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> that was a bad one. And I was in like 70th, you know, going into the last one. So, it was definitely a difference maker. You Good. know, I got to catch them at the next one, but it yep. it really where, where, eased Where's the, the next one? I know this answer, and I'm excited. I'm, yeah. like, jumping up and down. We're going to the St. Lawrence, yep. and we're taking out a way up the river, which I've never really been up there that far. Uh, Messina? Or? Messina. Yeah. Okay. And we went up there and practiced a couple of weeks ago, and it was a different experience fishing up there, which we fished the whole thing. We were there for five or six days, but – we fished all the way from Messina down to the lake, and we fished down there towards the lake a few times, and it's a little more familiar up there, way up the river. You know, you don't see many guys fishing up there, but we had some pretty awesome days up there fishing. So, I don't know. I'm I'm definitely excited for it. I'm ready to go and check you, it out. So, you don't think you have to make a big, long run there to catch good bags? I don't think you have to. I yeah. don't know what – it's been like since we left, it looks like they've gotten a lot of fishing pressure. But, uh, has, has one or two of them been caught? Yeah, I would imagine that they're <laughs> catching a lot of them. Yeah, but. I was joking because I've got a Toyota series, and I didn't realize you guys were going there till just a few minutes ago. Yeah. So it's been the MLF, then it was Bassmaster Elite, yeah. and then there's you guys for the Toyotas, or the, uh, the Tack Warehouse Pro yeah. Circuit, and then we've got a Toyota series. So, I mean, it's yeah. just like, oh, my gosh. Depending on how events. those – 
uh, I go to St. Lawrence next, and then directly after that, we go to Lake Champlain for the Bass Pro Tour. Depending on how those two go, I'll probably come back and fish the Toyota Series yeah. on the St. Lawrence. So, man, it, it just looks like fun. I know, you is. know, summertime. I just got back from St. Clair, and <laughs> gosh, man, just I mean, it's it's hoodie and shorts weather up yeah. there, and flip flops. The it's the weather's it's gorgeous. Perfect. Oh, it's perfect. And you get about twenty hours a day of sunlight. <laughs> that's a fact. You're like, I'm gonna get up at daylight. I'm yeah. gonna fish till dark. You're like, oh my uh, gosh. Yeah. You're ready to be off when you're done, but my yeah. gosh, you catch those fish. And no, it's crazy. Yeah. It's that I know for me, you know, it's just one of those things that's like you you look at hot weather summertime, you know, and you think, you know, if you think let's go catch a big bass, let's go to Fork, let's go to Raver, right. let's let's go to somewhere like that, Gunnersville, whatever. But it's like in the summertime, do not even largemouth fishing up there, you can go out there and catch smallmouths, catch four, five, six pound smallmouth. You could turn around and go throw a frog and catch forty largemouth. Right. You could do it all. Now you might not catch giants, but it's a lot better than Table Rock. Know. It's the, a lot better than Table Rock right The biggest now. one I caught up there was a largemouth. Was it? There and you it go. was the only time we pulled to the bank to go fishing. <laughs> and they come a big rainstorm. And we said, Make oh, yourself let, rethink a little let's bit. Let's go hide under this dock for a minute. And right oh. as we were getting ready to slip into this dock, I skipped my jig under it and caught a seven pound largemouth. And I was oh. like, wow. You hear to her first. How stupid is if that? Make, <laughs> if he makes another top 10, we probably have an idea what he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I like them smallmouth. They fight really hard, but. If I feel like I can catch twenty plus a day on largemouth, I'll probably go and do that. All right, so let's let's break into that a little bit. What what's your practice look like? You have two days. How do you? How, you know what I mean? Uh, anglers that don't travel and fish like that, they get you know they go for the weekend. They have two days to fish too. You only have two days to fish on these events. Not you're there for a week. Yeah. What do you look at? To make I mean, that it's it's been. I can't say it's a struggle only having two days. But what it makes you do is keep on practicing through the tournament. Mm-hmm. I mean, you if you don't have it just completely dialed in, you just keep on practicing. And I think that that's where we excel a little bit is just keeping on trying different things, new things. But a place like that, you know, baits and line size and all that, that's not really the issue. The issue on a place like the St. Lawrence is finding – where they're at, you know, what they're standing on. It's right. a spot fishery, not yeah. necessarily it's a not really you're fishery. not trying to figure out a bait to catch them on. Yeah. You know, they're biting the same little goby imitations, you know, <laughs> throughout the whole thing. Yeah. But it's definitely I mean that that thing's a hundred miles long. You know, what we can fish of it is a hundred miles from where we're taking off to the lake. We can't go into the lake. They made that off limits, and Canada's still off limits. But only having two days to break that down, of, <laughs> I'm glad I went and pre-practiced because yeah. that that's a lot. So what did you do? Go find spots you think the fish are going to be in, and you're going to go check them? I did. We went, and we marked a ton of stuff, you know, a ton of offshore stuff, which, as it turns out, everything's happening a little late, and I don't think they're going to be on a lot of that stuff yet. Mm-hmm. They're probably going to be some getting out there, but – I've been watching Bass Live all day, just like everybody they're else awful has. Awful shallow. They're still <laughs> shallow. Awful well, shallow. Which, that's fine with me. That's how we caught them when we were there before. So, you know, they're just going to be a little more beat up than when we were there before. <laughs> but Now, I mean, I'm not scared to go on largemouth fish, and I probably won't practice for them. You know, if I do, it'll be pretty random. You know, I'll just pull up there and make a few casts. But Because it's pretty simple up there. When you go largemouth fishing, you pull to the bank, yeah, uh, if there's a good looking patch of grass, you drop something down through it. You throw a chatterbait around it, a swim jig. If you come to a boat dock, you skip something under it. And that's your largemouth fish. Turn it off. High, <laughs> it's though. pretty simple, yeah. but and they've my dad and grandpa they've done had awesome tournaments all over in the north. Did your dad win one or really really top finish it up my, on with Champlain? Is my that dad right? Finished Second three times on Champlain. That's what I thought. I, yeah. And Grandpa won one there. Uh, why, why, how does that apply to anything you guys know? Because that is not like Lake of the Ozarks. No, it's not. it's not. But they fished Lake Minnetonka a lot, you know, back in the day. And some of those big milfoil lakes. And when they went up there, they didn't even think about going smallmouth fishing. I mean, they caught some, you know, when they needed fillers, but <laughs> what, they went, what's this brown thing? <laughs> yeah, they went largemouth fishing, and Champlain, you can do that. You can win on largemouth. Mm. Now, when we go back for, I go there for the Bass Pro Tour, it probably will not be a largemouth thing because Champlain is low right now, and that's, 
just doesn't really play for the largemouth. You know, everything moves offshore a little bit, and you'll probably still catch some, but I think smallmouth will probably dominate it just because you get so many more bites out there. But I don't know. I mean, they're still bass, and I like to chase them. No matter what they're doing, what they're biting, I want to go and chase them how I think I can win, and that's what I'm going to do. I mean, whether they be brown fish or green fish, I'm going to treat them both equally. Weight's weight. Four pounder, you know, <laughs> they they both weigh the same. If they're four pounds, I don't care what color they are. It yeah. makes me no difference. I'll weigh them in. You know. I like it. I like it. Well, cool, man. So you've got a jig company. Yeah. And you guys build jigs. I mean, I've I've been up to the house back in the day, crappie fishing with stick mm-hmm. coming up there, and – it looks like a mad scientist <laughs> factory in the garage with doing things like that. You know, yeah. we kind of do an in-depth section. We really dig into something. You want to talk about jigs? You want to talk about I sonar? What do you want to talk about? We can. We can talk about jigs. Let's talk I mean, about that, a jig. That's a big deal for us, and it always has been. Uh, you know, I sat around in the shop with my grandpa day after day watching him do it. and You know, it, it taught me a lot, and we still build a lot of the same stuff, but – it taught me how to think about it and taught me, you know, line tie angles and different things. And that is kind of a mad science. I mean, and <laughs> we build a whole lot of stuff that doesn't work, but you know, we might build 10 different styles of jigs, you know, and I might sit down today when we leave here and go home, you know, I'm going to sit down and build something because that's what we do every day. We're trying to come up with a better mousetrap of some kind. And, you know, yesterday it was a new and improved Ned rig. I can't say I'm proud of it, but <laughs> it's going to catch some small mouth, so i got to have the right one. But, you know, we just – we really try and focus on good hooks. I mean, we use all kinds of hooks, but for the most part it's going to be an owner, Gamagatsu, uh We've even started using some of the new eagle claw stuff. Which man, they they're make, wicked looking, aren't they? Pretty nice eagle claw hook now. I've I've had those. The MC some, makes a good hook now. That that's what's crazy is I think I feel like you know we own a tackle manufacturing company and we pour a couple hundred thousand baits a year easily and we you know we pour a lot of baits for a lot of different companies and you know people that come in they say well this is the hook I use it's the best this is the hook I use it's the best well. You know, it used to be brand X or Y, and right. it's like, oh, that's the best hook. Well, nowadays, I don't know if it's technology and the hook manufacturing or what, but it, when you start diving in, you know, I mean, even even like when um, Eagle Claw, who's the bigger company of them, the high-end hook that they make? Um, Trocar. Trocar. You know, now they've even got different styles from like pointed round tapers coming up to like a Trocar has like almost like knife edge angles, yeah. things like that. So, I mean, even in, in different brands, not just the necessarily the style of the hook or they all are copied off the same whatever style. I mean, you've got a bunch of different, you know, how that stuff different, you know, it lays and, and how it catches fish and penetration yeah. and does it rip a hole in the mouth when the fish and does it lay right, mm-hmm. stuff like that. How, I mean, how do you look at that? What, I mean, what, what do you start doing when you start checking different hooks? There's so many now. What are you looking at? We've got it down now, and me and my buddy, Dirk, we actually make a jig together. And uh, it's going to sound funny, but his little jig hook, or his little jig that, you know, is so well known in this part of the world, the Dirk's jig, it's got a little O'Shaughnessy bend hook in it. And an O'Shaughnessy, you know, if you bass fish very much at all, you're going to understand that because, I mean, it's been a worm hook forever. And we figured it out. Dirk figured it out a long time before we did, and we just got lucky enough to be in on it. But he figured out that if you're fishing eight foot or deeper, and I say eight foot, but eight to ten or deeper, you know, you really, that O'Shaughnessy really shines over a round bend hook. You're going to land way more fish if you use that O'Shaughnessy bend. And, I mean, it's not just the Dirk's jig. We put it in all kinds of stuff. But, you know, if you're fishing that eight foot or less, which for us is more of a flipping, skipping, you know, getting it up under them docks, stuff like that, we're strictly using a round bend hook. And is it strength? It, is that the difference in the gauge of the wire? Or no, what's the... I don't think it is. I think that it's the angle of the point of the hook. 
and we've actually messed with the angle of the line tie even, and that's not it. It's the angle of the point of the hook, <laughs> and I don't understand. I mean, I'm not into the science part <laughs> of it, but I do understand when I put it in the lake, and if it's over 10 foot deep, guaranteed, it's going to be an O'Shaughnessy bend hook. And if it's less than that, it's going to be a round bend because I, when I put it in the water, I intend on landing him every time. And we don't lose very many on a jig. I mm-hmm. mean, we will every now and then, you know, if they, you get that bite that runs right at you, you're going to lose him once in a while. But very seldom will we lose one on a jig. And it's just because we've put a lot of time and effort into figuring out the exact mouse trap. And the only reason we do that is because most people do not put in the time and effort to go out there and test their stuff. And we do. I mean, that everything that we use a lot has been thrown a lot and tested a lot. You know, if I'm going to use it in a big tournament, it's been tested <laughs> a lot. And we just put that time and effort out there. There's very few guys that do that. You know, most guys walk into the tackle store and buy their jigs, and that's perfectly fine. But they're they're going to lose some fish just because those mass productions, you know, there's not a lot of thought put in behind them. I can't say there's not a lot of thought. There is a lot of thought. There's just not as much – detail work i mean i i count the fiber guards down to the single strand you know how many i'm going to put in that jig and it's it takes stuff like that if you want to have the exact perfect mouse trap for it you've got to do it right and that's why we throw a jig a lot just because you know we feel like we've got the best ones out there and You know, we don't sell most of them just because I would have to charge $20 a piece for them to get my time out of them. Because uh, when I sit out at night, you know, I might only make eight or 10, but that's fine because I do that every night. And so I've got a lot of time invested into, you know, making the right jigs. And it's always been that way. I mean, dad won two world championships on it. Grandpa won one. Hopefully, I will someday. You know, hopefully that time and effort. Will if pay this season, off. yeah, I'd say if this season's any idea of it, I think I think your time's coming. So absolutely. So how do you, you know, as a jig fisherman, I'm trying to dive in deep in depth with some of this stuff and really try to get an idea. What does your tackle organization look like? I mean, if you're that way, you're probably that way with colors. You're probably that way with the color of the jig heads. I mean, do you have boxes of like jig heads and you assemble them when you get to places, or you know, how how does your boat look like? What what do you do to keep organized and Trailer organization, stuff like that. <laughs> is it a is it a Bass Pro bag? <laughs> no, no. It would probably be pretty embarrassing to most people because I carry about 40 Plano boxes of jig heads, <laughs> and it's a bunch, and it's every size and configuration that you can imagine. But I do, I hand tie pretty much everything we throw. And, you know, that's old school. You take a vice and... You wrap it on there with thread. You know, not many people take time to do it, but if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it right, and that's the best way to make it look right. But I, it depends on where I'm going. You know, if I'm going to Florida, I'm going to have a couple of jig boxes. You know, I'm going to have a swim jig box and a flipping jig box, you know, for grass. But when I'm going to a place with a lot of rock, you know, Smith Lake, I carried eight or ten jig boxes, you know, a couple <laughs> different little football jig boxes. Your Camus is running 53 miles yeah, an hour. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing, but I'm going to have the right ones in the boat with me. Yeah. Uh, does it change during tournaments, you think? Or is it pretty kind of once you get dialed in on what you're doing? Does it? Oh, it'll change for sure. I mean, that, things are always changing. But I feel like once I get dialed in – uh it's kind of hard to explain, but when you get dialed into like the weight of a jig, and especially if I'm fishing around a boat dock, you know, that makes all the difference in the world. When I get dialed into a specific weight, all that does is when you get that bite, you know it. And when you go to make that cast and sling it up under a dark hole, you know exactly how hard you've got to sling it up under there to get it to go under there. So I do focus more on weights 
And is it the fall? I mean, are you talking fall or you're just talking just ease of skipping, things both, like that? Both. I mean, when I know, when I get really dialed in, mm-hmm. I know exactly how fast it's fallen and how easy it is. I'm going to have to skip it up under there, however. But All right, I'm going to pry on this one. All right. <laughs> you get really dialed in to a size. That's right. And All right, uh, so you go to Lake of the Ozarks and you're skipping up in dark holes like you're saying. So you're in six foot of water, you know, you know what I mean? You get that right. feel, throwing a jig and spoon on table rock for me, yeah. you know, going up there flipping. So you, are you talking when the bait falls and it doesn't, you know, if, it, if you know in your mind it takes this much time for it to yeah. hit the bottom and it didn't hit the bottom, you know you got to fish. Exactly. So, I mean, there's that. Now, are you also, when, when you go dial, when you try to get dialed into a jig bite skipping docks like the Ozarks, are you... Does the fall rate matter on catching fish? Absolutely. Is that and a big? Is that is that one of the big nuts kind of of, of it that? It is for us. So don't just throw black and blue half ounce all the time. No, <laughs> definitely not all the time. Uh, we do throw it a lot, but no, it's not all the time. Uh, <laughs> what are you looking for when you're trying to get dialed in and you're going and doing something I, like that? What, okay, what's, what's the steps? What let's going talk your mind? Lake the Ozarks yep. just because that's our nuts and bolts fishing. But when I'm skipping around in boat docks, and it's not just the fall. I mean, it's right now in the summertime. I can go and catch my limit skipping underneath boat docks. But I'm going to start off, you know, I'm going to have a 3 Uh I've got one that's kind of in between that and a half that we've homemade, and that's the one that I use a ton. But it's going to be a 3 eighths, that one a half, and I'm even going to have a 3 quarter. And I've got a three-quarter ounce archie head that I can skip as far as anybody can skip anything underneath a boat dock. And there's just as many times as not, I can skip a light one in there like a three-eighths or a half and not get bit and then skip that one in there where it zips straight past them and they bite that one. So, you know, I definitely think that fall rate has a lot to do with it, especially early summer or Late summer, early fall, I think the fall raid has a lot to do with it. And I think that's why we excel a little bit that time of year is because we experiment around with, mm-hmm. you know, and it's through the day because it, it's every day it's different. So, you know, we try it every day. We'll throw something else, and it might not even be a jig. You know, we throw lots of stuff, but if it is a jig, we're going to figure out what size pretty quick. That's the main thing is figuring out, the exact jig that they want. We're going to have a couple of colors. We try and keep that fairly simple. Does it really matter? I mean, I know I know the answer is yes. It always is yes. But, I mean, how many colors, when you when you think how many colors, what are your go-to? I mean, I, I still keep that really simple. Uh, the later it gets in the fall, the more brown I throw. And the earlier it is, like, let's talk August, September, I'm going to throw a lot more black. And – green pumpkin, you know, darker stuff. I can't really explain that to you. <laughs> I don't know why, but I know when everything's standing up in that shade and they're like the summertime when that water's really hot, stuff standing in the shade, so it's going to get darker. You know, then bluegill are standing right up under that foam and they're going to get darker because they're standing in the shade. And that's kind of our thought process behind it. So that's why we start off dark and go light, you know, because I feel like in the fall, especially when that water temperature gets down into the 60s, we start throwing a little jig a ton, you know, like a little finesse style jig, short collared. And it's for the most part brown just because I feel like they start eating a lot more crawdads, you know, the later it gets in the fall, early winter. And something, something maybe to say at Lake of the Ozarks and, and lakes all across the country, though, is around the dock, you might not really be imitating a, you know, a jig might not be imitating a crawdad. Is that no. fair to say? I mean, it's I, a bluegill, it's a I shad, would say about a, 80% of your time when you're pitching it around a boat dock, you are imitating a bluegill, whether you think you are or not, <laughs> you know, because... I fished around a lot of boat docks, and I've never seen too many crawdads up there swimming around. You don't see many swimming But, around? you know, maybe if you're fishing table rock, working <laughs> it right on the bottom, yeah, that's a crawdad probably. But what a lot of people don't focus on is that suspended bite around a boat dock. Mm-hmm. And All right, we're getting into my thing. <laughs> and I'm like, we're going to stop here. No, I'm playing. About 80% <laughs> of the time, that's our biggest bites on Lake the Ozarks are those ones that are suspended. And 
you know, I, I'm not going to give away too many secrets about that, but I'm just we'll going to tell get you. Him. We're going to get you back on here. You need, keep to, crying. need to focus more on those ones that are suspended because a lot of times those are your four to six pounds. My, my father-in-law got drawn with your granddad one time in a, I don't know if it was a BFL or Toyota, whatever they were called back then, but, um, you know, Guido's Cove up the river, <laughs> they went in there and swam and did a bunch of stuff. Uh-huh. And I know he got a, he got a lesson of, of that. And, yeah. you know, he was, he was told to put a Cinco on behind. And whenever he had a little, he, your grandfather literally would know when the fish ate it, he'd shake them off in a tournament and say, Arnold, throw up yeah. in there. And he'd chunk it up in there and he'd catch a 15 on the dot fish. Yeah. And he just knew, I mean, it's unbelievable how dialed in these guys get and what you guys know on that lake and how you guys do it. And, um, it's, re- it's really cool to see. And just, you know, what you're sharing off and spitting off as broad information is pretty, pretty specific to some of us <laughs> common folk. So, well, I mean, it's just a lot of time and effort, you know, being out there on the water, and that's how yeah. you get really dialed in. There's practices, everything. I mean, whether you're fishing or playing football or basketball or whatever, yep. the more you practice at it, the better you're going to be. And yep. like the Ozarks, I mean, I barely graduated high school. I fish so much. And that's, you know, something not a lot of people <laughs> could say. But, uh, yeah, I barely made it through my junior and senior We're not year. advising that to all <laughs> no. the high school anglers that are out no, here. Please, you please finish go. your degree, your, yeah. high, your high school. <laughs> go to college, you know, get good grades because bass fishing ain't easy. It's fun, but it's not easy. Yeah. Lawson, thank you so much, man. It's been awesome having you. Thank you so much. I feel like um, I know I learned a bunch on this, and I'm sure a lot of our viewers have too. And Kaylin, our, the lady producing this, she's like, oh, my gosh, there's more than four baits in the lake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we're having fun doing this. Thank you so much Absolutely. for being on our show today. Um, everybody out there, check us out, like us, subscribe. And if you like more stuff like this, share it, post it, and we'll be making more content. Thank you.